And um, welcome again to People Talk. Uh, my name is Paul Lawrence, for those of you who don't know, and I am the host of the People Talk show. And I just want to say that I, I've just been listening to um, Eddie Nesta, Angela Ma, and Curtis Walker talking, and their show comes on right before mine. So I do try to listen into their show um, as much as possible. Um, a, because it's great fun, and B, because you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to hear what they're talking about and see if there's any synergies. And no, there weren't any synergies this week. But this week's show was very, very pertinent, you know, because they were talking about stress and they were talking about how, you know, especially men, we don't really handle stress overly well and how, you know, it's a shame that we don't talk more about these things. We don't, we don't go to therapists. We don't seek out help. And I think even though that's not what the topic of the show is today, I think that is how I'd like to start. I'd like to start by simply saying that, especially the men, not just the men, but especially the men, if you are in a situation where, you know, something's just not right, I think now is the time to really and truly think about seeking some sort of help. There's no shame in it, there's no problems in it. You just need to do that. You know, we're evolving, we're changing, we're different. We're different from our fathers and from our uncles who, you know, for whatever reason, thought that seeking that sort of help somehow made them less of a man um, in, in whatever context. So I think that was my takeaway from, from their show today. Um, so look, I wasn't sure I would be able to do this. I wasn't sure I would get a, a panel of gentlemen who were willing and happy to come and talk about singleness, about relationships. And um, I, I, I've gotten a good group of young men, and I, I, I say young men because you know I'm older than all of them. But um, what is what is what has been fascinating over this week is the interest that I've seen in in this week's show. There's been a tremendous interest in this week's show, and I think it's provided me with a nice bed of questions. I put out a little appeal about half an hour ago for some questions for the gentleman. And um, yeah, I've had a, a nice response to that to that question, uh, that plea. Um, I'm not sure what we're gonna fix or solve, so I'm gonna treat it more like a barber shop. So if you've not been in the barber shop, ladies, recently, then you know the guys are already laughing. You know, Dennis laughing for reasons that me and me and him and Andrew understand. Uh, rather Fitzroy, um, Tony, Tony, Tony needs to go to the barber, man. Um, <laughs> But we're going to have a chat. We're going to have a chat about stuff and hopefully, you know, shed some light on things that are important to us and, and, and so on. I do expect two more gentlemen to, to join me. Um, if they do, I'll, I'll bring them into the conversation. Um, so without further ado and any more chatter from me, um, I'd like the guys to introduce themselves. I'm just going to go from, from left to right because I can't remember this week who joined when. So I'm going to start with Andrew. Andrew, you need to Unmute yourself, say who you are, what you do, and why you're here. Uh, good afternoon, folks. I noticed that I'm the only one with hair on top of my head, so that's a, that's a first. <laughs> well, my name is Andrew Roach. Uh, I know Paul and Tony from 100 Black Men of London. You really want me to say what I do as a profession? Especially because I know what you do for a profession. Oh, Lord. Okay, well, if you're all going to run that. I work for Her Majesty of Revenue and Customs. So I'm going to see names changing here quickly. <laughs> no, he's, he's styling it. He's a tax inspector. Yeah. He's no, it's I, I actually work for the um, the debt management part. So I'm the one you ring up to say, can uh, can we make a deal or, you know, how do we arrange things? So, yeah, if you're getting frightened now, so I'm, I'm going to move swiftly up for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrew, first of all, thank you so much for joining. And, you know, it's, it's noticeable that it's not just about Andrew um, being someone been someone who um, visited and we met at the hundred, but Andrew also is a great supporter of the show, and he's he's very he's very very prompt in joining and has a record I think of joining first. So I think it's quite suitable that he he should join us today. All right, to my next guest, uh, Tony. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name's Tony Harrison. I run a 
personal development training company called QK Consultancy. Um, go under the title, the tag of the Confidence Coach, one of the founding members of the 100 Black Men in London a long, long time ago. That's it. What else would you like me to say? All right, Papa Swear, if not wrong. Dennis, <laughs> over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dennis Brown. Yes, um, I have a very creative father who named me after the Crown Prince. Um, I am a freelance graphic designer and financial educator, and I'm here to support today. I've known Paul and Tony for a number of years now, and I'm happy to support. Uh, Fitzroy. Okay, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Fitzroy Andrew. I think uh, my most important role is as a father of three daughters, and that may be relevant to what we talk about today. Uh, for a living, I do a number of things. Uh, I work as a coach. I'm interested in careers. I'm interested in people's growth. I also work at the University of East London, where I'm part of something called the equity team. And I guess the simplest way of describing what we do is to make sure that the university does what it needs to do in terms of delivering degree outcomes for every single student. Uh, and if anybody knows anything about further higher education, uh, some students do better than others. And there are some profound reasons for that. And our job is to tackle some of those reasons. Um, there are other things that I could talk about, but they may all come out in the conversation that we have. Uh, but it's great to be here. Good. Um, actually, one of the beautiful things is that last week when we had a session with the ladies, I also invited people to join into the, the, the Zoom as well. And Fitzroy was one of the people who joined into the Zoom. And... The moment he did, I said to him, look, you've got to come on the show. And, you know, he has. And I, I thank him for that. Um, boy, where do I begin? Um, it's a difficult thing to figure out where, where I should start this week. And I think that probably the best thing I should do is probably ask the, the very similar question that I asked the ladies last week. And the basic question is this. And, you know, Janet and Vanessa last week corrected a part of this. So it's going to be a slightly different, different way. I'm going to tone this question this week. Is it difficult? Are we experiencing difficulty in bringing relationships together that are lasting? Are we, are we you know, are men and women struggling to get together and create lasting relationships? Who'd like to be brave enough to go first? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I mean, in my experience, no. I mean, for me, it's what do you want from a relationship, first of all? You, what do you expect from the other? And are you based on the same page? So, look, there are people who only want physical, sexual relationships. And <laughs> they'll stay together for that long. They don't live together. I mean, if you're talking specifically about a monogamous lasting you know maybe family orientated relationship yeah i mean i still see them and they do occur i think it's what you're looking at and what you're experiencing and maybe your own personal experience sometimes may skew your opinion of that but i don't i don't believe that's the case no you see one of the reasons why i asked that question and i'm going to go to the other panelists as well is because one of the things that was expressed on last week's show and one of the things that is constantly being, whenever I say to women, I know lots of single men, the instant response is, where are they? Yeah, I have been asked to set up a dating agency so many times now, because I keep saying, I know lots of single men, yeah, who tell me that they're looking for partners and they'd be happy to, but everybody says, where are they? So, Tony, where are they? They're everywhere. They're, they're absolutely everywhere. They're, they're on your road, they're in your office, they're in your garage, they're, they're at your petrol station, they're absolutely everywhere. Here's the situation though, right, in light of the question that you asked, right, and I paraphrase and I say, is it, still, is it still possible to have kind of like good relationships? Well, you can have whatever you're prepared to work towards. And you've got to understand that like people are individuals which means that if you have a successful relationship with someone it doesn't mean that I have I will as well because my, the experiences that make me who I am today will determine the way in which I act in preparing myself or being in a relationship some people 
like who want successful relationships are not ready for successful relationships. They've not prepared themselves for, for a successful relationship. They're carrying hurt and damage from other things which happened in their life. And so therefore any chance of success is minimized. I don't believe anybody should dare to step to another person for a successful long-term relationship unless they have prepared themselves for that. Otherwise, what you're going to do is potentially cause more damage to yourself and definitely damage to somebody else who doesn't deserve it. How do we do that? How do we prepare ourselves, Dennis? How do we prepare ourselves? I mean, I, I don't know. Are you declaring yourself single? And if you are, how have you prepared yourself if you are doing so? First of all, yes, I am single. Um, the first thing is uh, in preparing yourself is, again, you're touching it yourself when you say yourself. So it's first knowing who you are and what you're about and what is it exactly that you're looking for. Um, what I find is that um, most men, um, well, I won't say most men, I won't speak for anybody else, but what it is, people have an expectation and oftentimes don't clarify with the other party what that expectation is. They just have the expectation. And then what happens is when the other party doesn't live up to their expectation, then it can cause problems. So it's so part of preparing yourself is not is deciding, well, it, as men, exactly what type of woman are you looking for? And of course, I'm not just talking about just the physical features and the, and the nice body and the pretty face and all that. Yeah, that's fine. As men, we are attracted to what we see physically in order to take the risk of approaching the young lady or however age is. But it's first defining, but what about character? What about, and I know it sounds cliche, but it's like understanding that there's a difference. The way how men and women view attraction is very different. And what I find is when I speak to a lot of women, most women focus on what is it about a man's character? You know, what is it about his personality? What is he bringing to, to the table? And, uh, and it's about, and men need to realize that what are you bringing to the table when you are approaching a woman? What are you, where are you leading her? Where are you taking her? What's the end game? And is it knowing those things is first, grounding yourselves in those principles first, which will prepare you for a long-term relationship if that's what you want because I, because like what my brother Tony was saying not many people are prepared for a long-term relationship or they have a misconception about it what is it you want it's Fitzroy you're you're you know I'm happy for you to answer any of those questions but what I also want to ask you based upon what Dennis was just saying was about those expectations mm -hmm. and I and I want to ask the question you know and again like I said comment on anything that went before there's, there's a, a school of thought that surrounds the concept that some of the expectations, you know, when we, when we discussed this last week, I, I used the phrase that the pendulum has swung too far. So what was once 100% tolerable, incorrectly so, now not only is it not tolerable, but the pendulum has swung a little bit further now. Do you feel that we're, 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 we've entered into a time where sometimes the, the expectations of men are unreasonable? Are the expectations of men unreasonable? Mm. Um, the expectations put on men by put women. On men are Let me unreasonable. Put it that way. Um, unreasonable. Not sure that's the word I'd use. For some people, I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's been said. And I'll say also the thing that I said last week when I started speaking was that whenever I hear this question, I'm always slightly bemused because most of the men in my circle are married and have been married for 20, 25, 30 years. For me, that is nothing unusual. So the idea that there is something about us, if I can speak about it in those terms, which makes us unsuitable or unprepared or ill-equipped for marriage, I, I find slightly bizarre. That's not to say there aren't people out there. And my take on this, and I speak as somebody who has been married and has been in relationships, been in and out of relationships, um, the conversation needs to start with you. Uh, there are all manner of reasons why you may or may not be in a relationship. Some of them may be to do with you. And that's where the expectation things become key. I think you have to go into a relationship knowing, as others have said, who you are. Uh, and therefore, what you expect of somebody else. And 
I think the main thing that you expect of somebody, the main thing that I expect of somebody, if I'm looking for a relationship, and right now I'm not, and I'm happy to kind of go into that, the main thing I'm expecting is that that somebody is themselves in the same way is that I'm going to be myself. And what I'm interested in is how develop that sense of who the person is, uh, because that's what I'm working on. You know, I've chosen to come out of relationships at different points in my life because I realize that actually I'm not sure who I am and what I'm bringing. And I think as Tony said, unless you're prepared in that way, entering into a relationship can be um, hazardous, damaging, unproductive in certain ways. Now, I'd like to think at the stage that I'm at, I've got a much better sense of who I am. And that makes me, I'll say it this way, more discerning which is not to say that I'm not going to get to know people, but I'm looking to be with somebody rather than anybody. So there's a difference between seeking a relationship for the sake of being with somebody, and I think for some people that's what drives them, and then seeking a relationship because you want it to be a long-term partnership, the companionship for having somebody to walk that path of life with you. That's not something that you can arrive at very easily or very quickly in my, in my experience. So I don't know how much that answers your question. No, no, it's cool. It does answer the question and it does feed back to some of the stuff that we were talking about when Victor Granville was on the program and Victor talked about, you know, everything, this whole thing revolving around self, started with self, understanding, yeah. understanding self. And Janet last week, one of the things she mentioned was about doing stuff with intent. Yeah. She, she talked yeah. about doing stuff with intent. So you're not doing it because you know what, I'm walking down the road, I can see Jackie, Jackie looks nice, hi Jackie, and we're off and running, and I don't know what my end goal is, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we, we need to be entering to things with, right. with, with that intent, um, so one question which has come out of the, 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 the feed, which, which I, I think I want to get rid of very early, and I think I want to answer this, it's, it's, it's rocky ground, but I'm going to go with it anyway, and the question, I think it, it revolves around this, again, these statistics that come out that talk to us about um, where we are as a, as a group of people. And one of the questions that came up was this. What's your view? And any, any of you can, can, can speak to this. What's your view on this, this idea that many black men are opting to go outside of their race because of those pre-mentioned expectations from black women. And yeah. that somehow, and, and, and personally, I, I find it a quite an insulting concept, but yeah. I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. That somehow our black sisters are too difficult, too demanding. And so we, you know, we, we take the easy option. Mm. I can see you laughing your head off, Tony. So <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because obviously it's an age-old comment that just does its rounds over round and round and round. Firstly, it's one of the most stupid things I think that come out of people's mouth. And that's not to say it doesn't happen. It's not to say it doesn't happen. Right? But I think it's a really kind of like unthought out statement. And I think that because firstly, if if a black man was to walk away from black women because he thinks that they're too strong, too powerful, too, too whatever, then those black women should say, thank God he's gone, right? Because he don't serve no value. If he's not capable to deal with the, t with the person who's in front of him, then that woman should be grateful that she didn't have to go through the mess of having to deal with a man who was inadequate in himself because that's what it is, it's an inadequacy that makes him feel he can't deal with or can't work with black women. You may have had a bad experience with a black woman, yeah? But that doesn't mean that the rest of the race is like that bad experience. So what happens if he goes to the white race now and has a bad experience and he goes to the Chinese, the Asian, the um, Portuguese and he has bad experiences, what's he gonna do, right? There's only a certain amount of races before he's gonna run out. So you can't generalize like that. And I think it's really small minded to take that type of view. The question I think is, right, again, and it's not a collective question, it's an individual question. As people, or let's say about, about women, as a black woman, right, are you prepared to work with your black man, whoever he is, right, 
so that the both of you can get the best out of what you want out of life. Because if you can do that, understand you're going to have some hiccups. It's going to go wrong. It's going to go off key sometimes. Sometimes you're not going to get on. But if you have an objective that you're working towards and everybody is in some kind of way doing their part, then you're going in the right direction. Anybody who's looking for this perfect situation where there's never going to be a, a problem, you're never going to have an upset, you're never going to have an argument, then come on, there's a little bit of immaturity there. And the age group which I spend my time in, right, I'd like to think that we're not acting so basic still. So <laughs> why do I laugh? I laugh just at the concept that people right, should be so generalistic in a statement. Are there women, are there black women who are really hard to deal with? Absolutely, completely. Are there some black men who are difficult to deal with? Absolutely, completely. Is that a reason why they should then stop dating within their race? No. For my Look, I, 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 I'm not even gonna, gonna carry that question any further. I think it's been killed and dead. What I do wanna pick up on is that one of the points you made, Tony, about um, people not being willing to hang in there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, not being willing to hang in there because very, very much, yeah, if I speak from my own personal experiences, and, and by the way, on the show today, that is all I'm speaking about, my own personal experiences. And none of you ladies don't ask me if I'm single. Somebody asked me last week and I'm not answering. Got nothing to do with any owner. So how comes you ask, so how comes you ask Dennis? Uh, yeah, look, I'm the host. <laughs> I'm the host. Liberty come through carelessness. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the question I want to ask is this: are, are we less tolerant, both men and women? So we get into relationships or entanglements or whatever you want to call it this week. But are we just less tolerant? And so the moment our fierce make up, we're gone. You know, the moment him leave the glass in the wrong place, we're gone. Andrew, you don't have to put your hand up. It's not school. Go for it. I just thought I'd do this. <laughs> I think, I mean, feeding on a part of what Tony said, sometimes you take your own personal experiences and you apply them to a situation. So growing up, you may have had encounters with black girls, say, for instance. They may not have been the most pleasant or whatever. So you take that as you get older into, well, I'm going to engage with a young woman or woman and they may be someone like the, um, the black girls I encountered. And rather than think, well, as Tony said, look, I've had encounters with X amount of black girls, but the world's a bigger world and I want to have different encounters with um, black women in different guys. And people think, oh, that experience, and that's so traumatic maybe. Maybe you've seen how your mum and, uh, your mom and dad, their experience, you think, I don't want to have that experience. So you take that and think, well, I'm not even going to wait. You know, I thought maybe, there's, there, you know, you may think, I'm not going to wait around for that. I'm going to get out quickly because there's so a the fear moment, that you may... So the moment you see the first sign yeah. of something that looks like what you know in a previous existence led to a disaster, you just pull the brakes. Protection. All the screens go up. Self-preservation. Yeah. Tony, uh, sorry, Fitzroy, what do you have to say about that? Uh, so let me understand what's being said here. The first... The first thing you encounter with somebody that you don't like, yeah. then you're thinking, okay, I'm out of here. Um, that has not been my experience. Um, if I were to be candid, I would say my experience is the opposite. Uh, I have certainly in previous relationships have stuck around to the point of experiencing things that I told myself that I would not experience. Preach. And that's a very Preach. dangerous place to get to preach yeah that's a very dangerous place to get to uh and it goes back to what you said right at the beginning about looking after ourselves you know i don't mind sharing i have been to counseling and therapy not on account of the relationships that i've been in i would say it's much more to do with early stuff but it takes doing that to unravel some of what you internalize and take on and sometimes you can do that because you tell yourself being in the relationship is the most important thing. Mm. It may well be that I'm experiencing <laughs> stuff that I told myself coming into it, I wasn't going to experience, but I'm going to hold on to it no matter what. Um, I don't think it's about the trivialities. 
to be honest. It's not about um, do they leave the toilet seat up? Do they put the lid back on the toothpaste tube? Um, I think there are things about communication and being listened to or not being listened to that I think are profound in this arena. And I think that they work for men and women in different ways. But I think that there, there is a point where once your communication really does start to break down, where there is, it's not so much no talking that's the problem, it's when there's no listening that's the problem. When either party is really not being listened to and get to the stage where they recognise they're not being listened to, that is the point I think, I think you have to really say, can I carry on with this? Really? Dennis, in the, in the chat, someone, someone, Julia Paris, had put in the chat, she said, you know, we live in a throwaway society okay. and sadly relationships are, are being viewed very yeah. much the same. Do, do you recognise yeah. that? I think there's an element of that. I don't think all relationships are like that. I definitely mm -hmm. um, think that with, um, with celebrity culture and social media and things like that, it can be interpreted that way, that a lot of relationships are like that. But I don't think all relationships are like that. Mm -hmm. And um, again, for coming from my, uh, my parents and my grandparents' generations, it was like through thick and thin. When you got married, you knew that was your partner for life. Nowadays, because of um, when we see a lot of celebrities, for example, it's like they get married one minute and they divorce like the following month. You know, celebrities get married for ninety days and and things like that. So um, again, to answer the question or back to the question of the point, I think it's also a case of where it's um, general certain relationships can be in a throwaway culture. It depends on how much you value the relationship, which goes back to what we said earlier on about who are you at the end of the day and what is it you're looking for. You know, if you really value the relationship or more importantly, you value the person, then in my, in my humble opinion, you will fight to maintain that and you will fight to sustain that. But that doesn't mean you tolerate total abuse. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it, uh, and, and that's another thing. We, to, when we hear abusive relationships, we tend to think that it's the man abusing the woman. And yes, while that is a reality, well, and I'm talking about both mentally or physically, the reverse also happens as well. You know, it might not happen as much. I don't know the statistics, but the point that I'm getting at is that abuse happens at both ends of the scale, whether it's a man doing it to a woman or a woman doing it to a man. So basically it's about how much you value the relationship depend, determines whether you're going to fight to keep that relationship and sustain yeah. it or not. Yeah. But yes, some relationships, not all, is basically. I, I, I just want to raise a point on something that Fitzroy was talking about, linked into what Dennis was saying, because... Mm. You know, Fitzroy said something which, which for me was a big touch point where he talked about staying in a relationship which things were happening, which mm -hmm. really he shouldn't have been allowing himself to, to, to be a part of it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I get that. You know, that, that, that is a big touch point, certainly in my head and my life and stuff that I've dealt with. And I think what I, I wanted to sort of draw on, on what Dennis said was that is it because very often when we think of abuse, and I know abuse and all that is, a, is another topic, but is it that we think of abuse as hitting? Why we, we, we sort of let emotional abuse, which happens to men just as often as it happens to women, in my view, mm. is it that we just let that slide because you're a man? You know, you're a man, you know, that thing because I, I find that we hang in there and I really identified what Fitzroy was saying. Stuff is not just going badly, but it is bordering upon, if not already in the realms of abuse. Yeah. And we just hang in there for years <laughs> until you know you wake up one day and you think to yourself, I can't do this no more. Yeah. I and I know this is a whole different show and a whole different thing, but it's it's really important for me because when we're trying to build relationships. And you find yourself four years in, and when you look back at the four years, you realize that actually you've been in an abusive relationship, man or woman, it doesn't really matter. But just because no hands were thrown, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense here. Paul, cool, I don't yeah. think it is a different show. I think it's very much a part of this show, but it's a very much underrated part of the relationship conversation. Um, one of the things which I'm really excited about in our current society is the... Um, increased in 
interest that we seem to be having with well-being, mental well-being, mm. and the way in which like it impacts on everything that we do. And I think especially within the black community, right, the Caribbean and African community, there's always been this image of the of the man being so strong. Uh, the man is supposed to be able to cope with everything. The man, he doesn't cry. You know, all of these emotional outlets, which are part of normal human beings, right? We have been determined to not need them and therefore have grown into not using them. Yet still, when things now explode and it gets to physicality, um, it's like, oh, this is such a bad man. Now, for me, 100% physical abuse is absolutely wrong. I don't see any circumstance where physical abuse is right. And the advice I'd give to anybody who finds themselves in a situation where they feel right, that their partner is winding them up to the point they need to lay hands, pick yourself up and leave. Pick yourself up and walk out the door. Those who say, oh, but she blocked the door. I, can't, I, I couldn't get out. Lock yourself in another room, right? Run if you have to. That's my advice for anybody who feels that physicality is the only way forward. However, from the other side, ladies, the tongue is a mighty, mighty organ, right? You hear That's the bass, you hear the bass, the voice, and I'm ah, saying, ah, it's a serious thing. He who feels it knows it. The tongue, right, is a mighty, mighty organ. And some of the times when words are being dashed, Right, when you dash your word and you even forget that you dash your word, that thing's resonating inside the man, you know. Right, he's in a situation where he's in a turmoil, he's cut, and some men do not recover from some of the things that they hear. Mm. Don't get it twisted, they mm. may even deserve what they heard, right? But it's the way we deliver our messages which make a real difference, and there's a lot of men walking around with all forms of emotional distress who don't know how to talk of it, talk about it because they're a man in it. So you don't talk about it. You don't show it. You just carry it inside you, carry it inside you until one day that load becomes too much to carry. And then you have like PTSD. You have, um, um, you have um, personality disorders because there's been no, they, they felt there's no way to actually let out this stuff that they've been carrying Right, because as a man, they're supposed to be able to cope. Mm. Now, this emotional distress doesn't just exist in men, but since we're talking about how emotional um, issues do impact on relationships, I think as well as we talk about the physical abuse that women go through, and let's notice men go through physical abuse as well, we have to understand that men go through emotional abuse and women go through emotional abuse. So this whole thing about relationships, I think we have to understand yeah. We need to look intrinsically at all parts of what makes a relationship successful, right? The way we communicate with each other, the way you said it fits where I believe it was you, the way we listen and we hear each other. Absolutely. Because if you're not listening to what somebody says, you can't feed into what they need. All you're going to do is feed into what you have to give. And that thing that you're giving may be exactly what that person doesn't need. It's breaking down everything. So it comes back to the whole thing of like, can relationships be successful? All relationships can be successful if people are prepared to do the work. And some of that work will mean you have to work on yourself. So, you know, we go around, this whole thing is just one circle. And like, you know, we can't skip any part of it. We cannot skip any part of it, right? We need to understand that we need to look at ourselves so we can be the best people we can be, so we can then feed into somebody else so they can be the best people that they want to be. Right? Mm -hmm. And together, we can be the best people that we want to be. Right? Yeah. Emotional well-being is everything. And we need to respect each other and understand that we need to look after each other, not just physically, but mentally as well. There's a lot, a lot of um, people in the chat who are um, both on Facebook and here in the Zoom feed. And by the way, anybody who's listening who wants to join us in the feed, think uh, the Zoom so that you can um, come in a bit quicker. You can um, inbox me on Facebook. And, and jump into the Zoom feed. Um, yeah, so like I said, a couple of people have mentioned that absolutely, you know, the emotional side of what the guys are talking about is, is absolutely real. But Marilyn Devonish has asked a question and I want to ask Andrew. Andrew, would you consider therapy? Because, you know, we've been talking about the effects of these things. Um, and I think Fitzroy has already mentioned. And by the way, one of you guys named Andrew, I mean, Fitzroy, Andrew is confusing me. So yes. 
Blame my parents. Don't blame me. Blame my parents. So blame the ancestors. Blame the people that gave us our name. But that's a whole other The Scottish people, yeah? Yeah. So, so the question for Ola, you know, Fitzroy's already declared his hand. Um, we've talked about the sort of trauma that we carry for whatever reason. It doesn't just have to be via relationships, certainly not. It can come from other things. It can, you know, and I, I'm a very strong advocate for what I'm about to say, where I think that we as men carry a very specific type of stress because we are trying to exist in what I consider to be a racist environment. I think there's a very specific type of stress that is connected to that. We'll talk about that later. Mm. Having recognized that, you know, we're all here. I can see all of you guys, you're all nodding, agreeing with what Tony has said, what Fitzroy have said. Why don't we all do some therapy? That's ex exactly why I took a big nod to Eddie Nestor's show. You know, Eddie works for the BBC, going through a lot of stress last week because of that use of the N word in the BBC and having to exist in that space. And then he said, you know what, I'm going to go do some therapy. Is that a starting point? We've been talking for three weeks now around this topic of relationships. And every single week, by the time it gets to about half an hour in, the same thing comes up, looking after self. Mm. Is it time for us as black men to say, let's lift the lid off this. Let's really get some self-help. Andrew, what's your thoughts on therapy? Yes, I would definitely advocate it. Even sometimes when you think you don't need it, when things are going well, there's nothing wrong with having a conversation professionally and, uh, and just examining things to understand, it's about understanding yourself better. I mean, as been said previously, if you don't understand yourself and you present yourself to someone else and you don't know different aspects about yourself, I mean, I'll just add quickly in there, when you, when you go on that first date, everything's going well and you present the best of you, you know, that's, that's, that's something quite nice. In, in terms of, just in terms of why do you stay in a relationship uh, far longer than you should do? Because you've seen that best. You're attracted to that, oh, that's what that person actually maybe is. And you're, you're hanging on for that because you're thinking, we're going to return to that. Rather than, I think sometimes when you go on your first initial dates, you don't realize that you're going to encounter aspects of a person that may jar with, with you. And I think it's understanding the whole of a person, the whole of yourself, the whole of that person. So I just want to add that in there. But certainly, yes, I think everyone should be having or uh, um, having some sort of professional therapeutic um, dialogue with someone just to just to make sure that, you know, there's not things going on there that. Dennis, what do you think? No, definitely. The, I mean, the, the issue I've had in the past is who can I trust and the fear of ridicule. I think, the, um, I can't speak for any other men, but it's, can I trust this person? Can I really open up and, uh, and really express myself to this person exactly how I feel or the issues I encounter and so forth? And one of the things, speaking for myself, that has really kind of like stopped me or prevented me from doing that is actually the fear of ridicule, which goes back to something that Fitzroy mentioned earlier, and I think Tony touched on it, is our experiences in the past. Because there's times where, as a man, I would go to my brethren or my close friend, I would ask advice, and they'll be like, cha, man, what's wrong with you? I would laugh, and, and, and to them, it's funny. And then you, of course, you laugh and you brush it off and you pretend like nothing's wrong and you just carry on about your business. But really you're thinking inside, speaking for myself, I'm thinking inside my head, okay, how do I really deal with this? And then and then it's all, as I said, it goes back to what I think even you mentioned, Paul, about because we're men, we feel that we're tough and we're strong. And, and then if you add ridicule into the equation now, that's definitely just kills it. You're definitely thinking, right, I can't trust anybody. And then, all of that builds up in size. Don't get me wrong. I've never laid my hand on any woman. Don't get me wrong. But that builds up in size that people have done till one day it just explodes. All right. Um, so to answer your question, definitely therapy is something I would um, recommend. But for me, speaking for myself, it's about a trust issue. Can I trust this person to open up and not ridicule me, <laughs> basically? You know, it's, it's, it's funny because I don't, I don't know, Dennis, if you were listening to the show two mm. weeks ago when we had Victor Granville 
on mm. the show. And, and one of the things that he identified as a reason why we don't sometimes go in for relationships is that fear of rejection, that fear that mm. something that somehow we're going to be judged if we come up short in, in, in some way. So all of what you're saying here, I, I absolutely get and I absolutely understand. Um, look, we've been talking about this and it, for me, it's, it's very good, it's very deep and we're, we're really getting there. About two years ago, and Andrew can probably correct me if I'm wrong, um, the Hunter Black Men of London started out a series of talks called It's Time We Talked. And this is a, a range of programs specifically targeting black men because we recognize very much that for whatever the reason, it doesn't have to be just relationship basis. It, it could be around other things. We weren't talking. So in terms of the whole idea about us getting back, uh, getting into therapy and accepting the role of therapy, I just want to say that certainly, yes, I think that we've, we've sort of taken a curve on that now. And a number of organizations I see are promoting and pushing um, for men to get, get therapy. And, and not just for relationships, as I said, but also because of the high instance of mental health issues that black men have that go very much uncharted and go on, go on for a while. But I wanna, I wanna change tact a little bit to a, a dialogue I had about, um, well, the, the dialogue was about me. So someone asked me, how comes, and I'm gonna use the right words, I appear so supremely confident. And her concern, yeah, and she, she's a self-declared single woman, is that she feels as if men don't have the confidence anymore to step up, yeah? I don't even know where to start because I can see smiles all across my screen. And for viewers at home who can't see this, I can just see something. Have, have, have brothers lost that confidence? I know in Jamaica, you know, you could be walking down the road with your woman hand in hand and some guy in a tear up trance and no shoes will chirp, sir. Zero lack of confidence. My African friends uh, from the African continent who live here in the UK, I see that same level of confidence as well. Is, is there something in there? Have, have a lot of confidence been taken out of the men? Because I remember Vanessa made a point about the level that this guy was approaching her. Almost as if he wanted the full green light before he put himself mm. at risk, as it were. Yeah. It's right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, it's, it's an issue. I wonder, there's a conversation about what we mean by confidence. Mm because, and this came up in our conversation last week, um, you and I are extroverts, no, introverts. Thank you. And I, I'm, mistake, glad you I'm glad you remembered that because Yeah, Sharon, I did remember that. Sharon, because who people, was on the show last week, laughed yeah, when I said I was People introvert. confuse introversion with a lack of confidence and they are not the same. So if by confidence you mean being extrovert, being outgoing, being prepared to make the first move, that's as much about personality as anything else. Um, and it can also be about situations. Some people can be confident in certain situations and be very upfront like that and not in others. I don't see there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Tony. Now, if there's an expectation that as a man, it is always your job to step to a woman and say whatever you want to say if you're interested. OK, but I'm not sure that if a man doesn't do that, it's necessarily said anything about their confidence. They may, they may just want to choose the moment at which they make that approach. Tony, mm. confidence. I, I know you. I've known you for as long as I've known the 100 black men. That's 22 years. We've run a business together. We've hung out together. So, you, so you know I lack confidence in, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. All right. So maybe I don't lack confidence, but, you know, I'm going to echo what Fitzroy said. Because you're confident, it doesn't mean that like you're confident in everything. I too consider myself an introvert. I, I often tell people that I'm not shy, but I am a reserved person. Mm. Now, sometimes, right, if you get me at the right time or the wrong time, 
you won't believe I'm reserved at all because I can be out there. Um, but there are other times where I just don't want to, and more to the point, I don't even feel like I can. I, I need my space. I need, I, I need to be away. I have been in the room and I'll be the person speaking the least. So that's not me being um, lacking in my confidence. It's just that I actually am not in the mood, right, to be extrovert. That all said, I personally do believe that there is a certain lack of confidence amongst men, specifically in the United Kingdom. And I think that's because the way in which we are programmed as black men in the United Kingdom is very different from how you're programmed as a black man in Africa or in the Caribbean. In the United Kingdom, there are lots of negative um, associations that go with being black, right? And unless you've got a positive environment that you're growing in, it's quite possible for you to start believing the negatives about you. You don't work. If you do work, you do a menial job. If you do a menial job, you're not supposed to have lots of money. You, 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 you don't have your own place. You, lit, you depend on your girlfriend or your partner to um, um, put a roof over your head. You can actually start to believe that rhetoric because it is spouted over and over and over again. And guess who spouts it a lot? The black woman. So when you're hearing that, right, you can, especially if you see a woman who you think looks good and, you know, I've heard men say, oh, she's out of my league, mate. Oh, I could never talk to her. I'm like, what are you talking about? Start yeah. with hello. <laughs> so start with hello and a smile. Let's see where we go from there. But if they believe that they're not worthy and they believe they're not worthy because of the rhetoric that they've heard and they've been told, then yeah, their confidence is low. Now, I don't surround myself intentionally with people who think and act like that because I don't, that's not going to work for me, right? Birds of a feather flock together. That's not my flock. But in the same breath, if that saying is true and you do think like that, then you're going to surround yourself with other people who also think like that. So then it becomes normal in your circle, right, to not believe that you're capable or you have, or you have the um, capacity to show the real you. Yeah, and so you, you go further and further down this line, right, of not believing that you can, and so therefore you don't do. And so to the women then who who are out there, you're in you're in a party, you're in a wine bar, you're at a wedding reception, whatever. And she's thinking, oh, that's a nice looking guy. When's he going to come talk to me? He's over there thinking, oh, she's a lovely woman. Oh my god, but how do I say hello? And this is all. It all comes from something. It all comes from somewhere. And I say, coming back to this whole thing earlier comes back to the way in which we've been programmed and we have to break some of this negative programming. Comes back to the way we've been programmed, Dennis. I'm, I'm reading um, Melody um, on Facebook. She made a comment. She said um, that she's in Turkey right now and <laughs> she's been approached left, right and centre mm. by men. And she said she's never approached in this way in the UK. Mm. I, can see, I can see Jackie smiling. So I don't know if that's a smile of confirmation that that's the same. Yeah. What your, well, what's, your, what's your thoughts? Okay, first of all, um, just touching on from where Tony left off. Um, in the UK, going back to your original question, I do think there is a degree, obviously it doesn't apply to all men, just like to put that disclaimer out there, but I do think there's a degree where the confidence has taken out, been taken out, and it goes back to what Tony was saying earlier on about programming. Um, in England and in the West in general, and I think this, this is necessary, you also, there's the worry or the concern about um, sexual harassment or if I approach a woman, is she gonna say I'm harassing her or getting on her nerves and the next minute I find myself in trouble. I know that's an extreme example, but that also goes on. There's that concern as well. Am I allowed to go and approach a woman in this way? With her, otherwise, uh, or she's going to think that I'm harassing her in some way. There's also, and, and what is interesting enough, actually, what I'm about to say next, you know, I spoke with a Jewish woman called Marnie Kinris about this, and she said um, a lot of men don't understand um, that attraction for women works differently to men. We think it works in the same way when it doesn't. 
um, and I'm sure most women here would agree, women are more motivated when it comes to attraction by personality and character, whereas as the receiver, whereas men, when they're approaching a woman, we first have to like what we see to take the risk of getting to know the personality and the character, if that makes sense. So, um, and again, the, the, nothing is absolute. There's always going to be exceptions to the rules. But when a man approaches a woman, the reason why a man judges a woman on her looks, he's looking at how pretty her face is, um, how pretty her body is, et cetera, et cetera, to take the risk of approaching her. And the reason why I describe it as a risk is because I don't know what type of woman this is. She could be, she could be, she, all I know is that she looks fine, but as a person, I have no idea what 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 type of woman she is she could she could be totally insane she could be normal i haven't got a clue right <laughs> i won't find it out until i speak to her <laughs> right I'm, sisters i'm just trying to give you what goes through some of us men's minds when we approach the woman why i use the word risk right so from a man's perspective to approach any woman it's a risk because i don't know what type of person you are now what happens is after i decide i'm going to take the risk of approaching you <laughs> right um, a woman, when she's judging a man on his physical appearance, she's looking at, okay, does his shoes and belt match? The, is there dirt underneath? <laughs> <laughs> you know, basically, what it is, is like, if you can't take care of yourself properly, then the assumption, rightly or wrongly, will that be made to take, take care of, care of her. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? And, and, and when Marnie explained this to me, I thought, okay. So it's, um, that, that was like my light bulb moment. It's understanding the different ways how attraction works. So going back, I know I've gone full circle, going back full circle, it goes back to what Tony is saying about programming. Yeah, it's about understand, rewiring and undoing the programming that a lot of us. To sum up in one word, um, Paul, a lot of men are just afraid to approach women. Yeah, that, that, that's what it is. That, and again, I know that's not all men, and I'm not speaking for all men, but it's just a matter of fear. Yeah, and it's about looking at ways of how to overcome that fear. You've been sitting patiently, Andrew. Yeah, I was going to add as well. I grew up in an era in the 80s where it was all about, hopefully you all know, your lyrics. You have to have lyrics. So you can approach a woman, you have to have lyrics. But then consequently you're thinking, well, if she's a beautiful woman, she would have heard all those lyrics. What am I, what new am I going to bring? So I'm going to go there and she's going to be looking at me like your lyrics are whack. I've heard all that. Bring something new. So again, bring it into the rejection. You're thinking, and it's funny now, I have that now. I used to think growing up, I had to have, so you're almost like you're going to work and your lyrics are coming something, something new. And actually now, I get accused of speaking lyrics. I'm not dashing lyrics. I'm just speaking, but it's like, to them it sounds so, so it, it's funny when you are yourself, Sometimes that natural authenticity will come through. And the other thing about this is, I mean, I know even again growing up, there were guys, it's all that like they had had in their in their mind, I'm anticipating the rejection. I don't care. I'm gonna talk junk, I will get someone. So maybe, as you said, growing up your experiences is like, if I get rejected, so what? It's about how you take that rejection. I thought the more rejection you get, maybe the less you're gonna feel the next time and all that. So but I, it just, I was a thing about the lyrics. I think <laughs> lyrics are the strange thing. And it's funny in a way you're thinking, well, you want me to come up to you confidently and speak, but then I may come across as, you know, it's lyrics. I, I've heard that all before. So it's like, how does it work? If I come to you just act shy, act myself, isn't that good enough? I'm being me. Isn't that what you want to perceive? Me, not some caricature of this smooth talking dude. Because then when you, you know, you get in a private moment. <laughs> Do, so yeah, do, I that. Do, do we do we do we um live in an age where it is that expectation that the man stepping across the room boldly, you know, um, you know, you know, my baptism into the dating world was a baptism of fire. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but we we grew up in Jamaica where you you went to parties with your big brother, your big brother, he had all the lyrics in the world. And you were like 13 and she looked cute and you see a big brother step across the room. Yes, Hubert, as you are talking about. And she'd, he'd step across the room. He'd ask the girl to dance because we did that in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And she'd say yes. And you would pluck up your courage. You'd walk across the room. You'd ask her to dance. She would say no. And you have to take the walk of shame back while your big brother and embracing them a laugh. Mm. But 
that baptism of fire taught us that you keep going across the room and you you sort of had this philosophy where actually probably you should ask her to dance right away you should say hello you should introduce yourself you should work it and that was our lyrics yep you you brought up a conversation i didn't grow up here what's different here because i can tell you i have heard women say that if you want to boost your self esteem go to jamaica yeah if you if you are a woman and you're struggling a little bit yeah. whether you're tall you're short you're fair you or whatever go to jamaica because them man do not care and i can say fit strike i fit right i let you know sorry i I'm, I'm having i'm having problems with this conversation uh, and i'll tell you why i'm having a problem with it it rests on a presumption that and i'm not saying it's wrong but i think this is part of why it's kind of misleading i have never found clubs a great place to meet women very true. frankly very true i will go further than that um i think that if that's where you're looking for your partners whether you're men or women it's no wonder that you're going to struggle a club is a very artificial kind of place to strike up a relationship you know, if I think about my own experience, and this is why, this is why I think the confidence thing is unraveling. Um, if I think about the relationships I've had, they've either been through work, not necessarily in the same workplace, but through the work that I do and the kind of the networking and socializing that comes out of work, or when I'm around friends. And so for me, that means the opportunity to kind of be yourself and strike up a conversation is in a completely different context. A club is like an arena. So in a sense, I'm not surprised. And, that, and, and be, you know, speaking personally, it's never been a place where I found it particularly easy to meet. It's, it's, um, it's, cru it's, it's a not crucible. why I go to clubs. It's a crucible and, and it's hard. But yeah, I, yeah. Want to, I want to press you on something which you just said, which is about okay. how you have met partners. Yeah. Which is, which is very important. And I want everybody on the panel to touch on this. We, we, we accept that, you know what, the days of, you know, parties, house parties are gone. You know, for, for the most part, we're, we're big men on this panel. We're not, no, there's no little boys on this panel. Yeah. So we're, we're of a certain age. I, I haven't been to a club unless it's a birthday invite for, for decades. Yeah. I cannot in memory remember on a Saturday night saying I'm going to the club. You know, I, I have no memory of ever doing that. Oh. I'm going to ask you the question that the women have been asking me for the last three weeks. If Fitzroy dispels the concept of the club, where do we find the caliber of women I'm assuming we aspire to? And I'm going to add just this part to it. If you are seeking a partner, if you are looking for a partner, um, would you consider a dating app if the normal places don't work for you? I'm going to okay. stick to go, go, Andrew. Go, Andrew. I'm going to start with this. I think, some, again, for me, sometimes this whole dating regime almost, I think it can give a bit of a falseness. The person you strike up a conversation with, it could happen anywhere. So in striking up a conversation, you start to engage and you find the interest and you start talking further. I think if you put pressure on both yourself, if you put pressure to say, I'm going to go here to meet someone who I'm going to lead that way. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but are you actually listening? I mean, it was said, I think maybe a bit Tony said about the art of listening. So if you're going to sit with someone and talk with them, what are you trying to ascertain from them to sort of say, right, well, I want to take this further. So if you sort of say, right, well, I'm only going to go here. That's why I'm going to meet the woman of this. You might be missing out there. You might meet the woman over there. You, you don't know where you're going to meet this particular woman, where it could lead to. But in order to strike up a conversation, you've got to be receptive to have a conversation. Maybe you might find that conversation will occur rather than I have to go here. This is the only person I'm going to meet. Some men do think I've got to go to a club and meet women there. I've got to go to this place and meet women there. So I've got to go to church. Can you meet a nice, good church woman? And she'd be all right. You, know, you, you have to throw all that myth out. You meet someone 
you engage, you find what interests you may have, but also you, you it's about having a conversation because all right, not every conversation you have is going to lead somewhere, but in being receptive to have a conversation and see where it goes, you have conversations rather than I have a conversation with this, this is what I want. I have a conversation, a conversation to conversation. Let the conversation flow. I'm gonna That'd I'm be- gonna I'm gonna go to the other guy, but I want to caveat what Andrew just said because when I was speaking to the ladies last week, one of the points they raised was that when they go to places. Yeah, to the type of places that they go to, there's really ever any men there. When they go into spaces, the spaces are almost 100% occupied by women. And I'm going to be honest, a lot of the events that I go to, because like I said, I'm not a club man, I'm not a dance man, that's not my thing. I will go if I'm invited to an event, for sure, love my music, but I'm not a dance man. But the places I go to, like whether it's a debate, whether it's a talk, whether it's an event at a library or something like that, it's kind of 99% women. So I'm back to my question. And I noticed you sort of shirked away from it, Andrew. Dating apps or you, d- you don't move with intent like that? I have no interest in, I've never tried. I mean, my son, for enough, I had, he put me on Tinder, I believe it was. And I was mortified. I've not had any feedback or whatever, but I'm just thinking, do not put me on a date in that, please. I, you know, no, 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 no. Not that I'm that vain to think I'm going to get things, but I, I, again, I, I just think it's artificial. For me, I think so, um, a relationship, any relationship you have, I mean, if you take away dating, you talk about your, all your long lasting relationships, they're organic, they happen. You don't force it. You don't go to school say, right, I'm going to, make friends and I want to get this amount of food you've got to let these things happen and then let them do everything that way rather than right I'm going to go here this is for this so let me go on a date that let me start food and go on a look and then go there you're, you're at your best I said you're going to encounter that thing where you're going to encounter something about that person that may grate you are you going to think right I'm going to stick at it or actually mm, your picture doesn't quite match your personality swipe away I, I'm, I'm, I'm not me personally I'm not into dating that Dennis Brown, Crown Prince. What, what I would say, <laughs> Crown Prince. What I would say, Brother Andrew, is Tinder's just one. Remember what we said about not judging everybody? <laughs> and Tinder's not the best one, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry for your experience, but trust me, Tinder's not a great one <laughs> to start off with. <laughs> you got others like Plenty of Fish. You know what? I'm not going to advertise them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> Go for it, go for it, Dennis. Dennis got a place to go. No, a bit more classy, okay? <laughs> no, I've been there, innit? Yes. Last, last, there. Uh, last week, I mentioned... We're among friends, it's all good. And it didn't go down very well when I said grinder last week. <laughs> My inbox was, was totally full. Um, you know, just Hopefully outside, not for dates. Outside yeah. of my sphere of understanding. So, yeah. it's right. Say- yeah, I think that the whole date, dating apps are misnamed. They're not dating apps. They're a way of meeting people. What happens then is entirely about how you conduct yourself. There have been times, and I've never used apps. I've used websites when I've been in a frame of mind where it's like, I want to meet some people, and they work. They work. I think Absolutely. they work better for men than they do for women. Now, you know, generalization alert, there are a lot of weirdos on those kind of sites. And I think women, what I've heard from women is that they meet a lot of strange men through those sites. So I understand that there's some wariness about them. But meeting somebody on the app is not the date. It's meeting somebody. What you then choose to do following that, I'm okay. Listen, I can sit down. I can have a conversation. A cup of tea is safe. A drink is safe. A meal is safe. What happens from there is entirely mutual. And that's how I present myself. So if you, are, if you have integrity and you present yourself, in a way that has integrity, there's nothing, to, there's nothing to fear from apps. What I get is that some women will feel, I'm gonna be cautious. And I get that because there are some horror stories out there, but the app is not the date. The app is a channel for meeting people. And I think you just look at it in those terms. And then if it works for you, in terms of connecting with people, take it from now. I, I love about, that, I love oh, that fits right. I think, I, think, I think that's actually a very, very strong point in terms of how do we meet people? Are we willing to use, I don't know, Facebook, 
to, to meet someone, yeah, to, 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 to meet someone and, and see if it leads to a date. Yeah. Cool. Can I just say, in what it off of what Fritz Sawyer was saying, um, gen generally, um, you'll find, and you're right, Fritz Sawyer, there are a lot of mad people. <laughs> but generally, um, if you go on the ones where you pay a subscription for, generally, the people there are more. I hear more. that. I hear that. I wanted to throw that out there. But you're right. The, the, that risk is always there, regardless yeah. of where you go. Sorry, go on, Paul. No, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, Tony. There's also a lot of creative presentation yeah. that goes on in those apps as well. The photograph that you see on the site is not necessarily who you encounter if you meet them face to face. And I'll, I'll just leave that there. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm sorry for your experience, by the way, Fitzroy. Sorry? <laughs> I hope you recovered. No, that's no, Andrew. Andrew. Go, man. You know, like I said, I've been to therapy. I've kind of got through it. <laughs> well, here it is, though, right? So... Let's do the app talk first. Are, are dating apps a good or a bad thing? Look, it depends on the person. Uh, it, depends on, it depends on what you want, because from what I know of dating apps, I don't use them, but I'm fully aware of them. You can go on a dating site and you can meet somebody who turns out to be your husband. You, know, you can find somebody and within like an hour, you can be wrapped up in their bed doing all the things that carnality can give you. It's, it's, it's entirely down to you. It's like you get what you're looking for, right? And if you get what you're looking for, then the question is, what are you looking for, mm -hmm. right? Once you've worked out in your mind what you want, right, then you will, I think we're missing something. There's this thing, and I know we all know it, it's called universal law, right? What you put out is quite often what comes back to you. Right. So if you're saying, oh, no, 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 I want a really good man. I really want a really good man. But the first time the man says to you on a dating site, well, send me a picture of yourself and you send in a picture of your tits hanging out. I'm not saying naked. Right. But you, you, you send you send a picture which is going to take you down a sexual route. So when a man starts being sexual now, how are you going to be upset with a man? Right. Because you've directed the conversation in that way. When you say to the man, oh, send me a picture of yourself, and you send her the picture of your, in your tightest trousers, right, and the whole of your chest hair, right, just kind of like sticking out the top. So when she now starts to ask you personal questions about yourself, how are you going to be confused about the way the conversation is going? We need to be aware of what it is that we are not verbally asking for, but what we are universally asking for, because that then will attract you to what it is that you intentionally or unintentionally want where do you find good people i think i said in uh, in an uh, earlier comment you find them everywhere and i'll be honest with you I, I think looking for a good partner is highly overrated i just think it's just like the worst thing you can actually do why are you looking why don't you just live your life Agreed. why don't you just be happy why don't you just allow your natural character to come through right and allow that to attract the appropriate people into your stratosphere. Because I'll tell you, once you start looking, you'll be amazed at what will find you. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, just saying, isn't it? Well, you know, there's been a lot of, lot of stuff in the chat. Um, a lot of women, um, Julia, confirming that, you know, the African and Caribbean men are extremely confident. Hoorah. Number one for the yard is in the house. I don't know much about these Trini and Bajan guys. I, I don't know if they're they're good. They're, they're a little village on the left-hand side of Jamaica, but they're cool too. Hey, stop my day there. But one of the things that keeps coming up, and you know, we touched on it slightly before, is about the approach, the manner, the manner in which men, and a lot of people both in the chat on Zoom and out on Facebook are saying, the ladies are saying, yeah, how you look is important. You know, they like, like a, a gentleman who looks good. They like a gentleman who smells good, who pulls himself together and so on. But ultimately, all of that can be defeated if the manner of his approach just doesn't work. It's just wrong. And, and you know, that's where the danger of being overly confident can sometimes play into that. And um, again, one of the things that we've, we've been talking about is how that that manner where is it manifest why is it that we have the situation where some men have that manner and it puts our women on the defensive it makes them defensive and as andrew said it could well be that his very natural approach is that approach which unfortunately she's had before she's heard that before and she sees it as a chat up line 
So I'm going to flip the script around a bit and ask you guys, if we know that that's where it is, how do, would you feel about a woman approaching you? She, she's, she's on the Zoom. Mm. She's, she's, she's been on the Zoom all day and she's just inboxed me and said, Paul, look, man, I think you've got some fine brothers there. How would you feel about a woman approaching you? Fine. Fine. I mean, you know, yeah, I think if you put too much pressure on someone to be something which maybe they're not or they find difficult, you should be surprised at the result. At the end of the day, a relationship has to start with a conversation. Whoever initiates it, initiates it. If you're actually saying that only men can start a conversation which will lead to getting into a relationship and me and <clears throat> getting that way, then furthermore, if women who say that they never chat, um, approach men, how are they going to understand that man if they start going down that route about him showing vulnerability and sensitivity and empathy and all that? Because those are sort of things that you have, but you're not allowed to express because there's an expectation that you're going to be this confident person come up, you know, I'm like paraphrase, what happened to be a <laughs> going to do that sort of thing. So at the end of the day, you may be quite a shy, reserved person. You do have the courage then to strike up that conversation with that woman. But then in your mind, you're thinking, well, she wants to see X. So there's the pressure that I've got to present myself in this manner. And you're wrestling with yourself. You're not having a, a natural, organic conversation. Tony? So I'm right. Like, if a woman wants to say hi, let's meet up. Fine. There you go. Tony, lady shows direct interest in you. You might need to unmute. Sorry, say again. I said, what would you, how would you feel about a woman expressing direct interest in you? Step into you then, to put it that way. I feel very happy, thank God. Right? right. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? What's the problem? At the end of the day, look, right, we are not living in the 30s anymore or in the 20s where it, women were so repressed that if they spoke to a man, it meant that she was a witch or something. Then days are gone, hallelujah. Right? If a woman wants to come and say hello to me, I'm more than happy to say hello back, right? And like I said earlier, for me, everything starts at hello, right? If I go up to somebody and I say hello, I don't know where the conversation's going. I don't have a plan as to what the next thing is going to come out of my mouth. And I would hope that she doesn't have a plan as to what the next thing that comes out of her mouth is. Maybe the next thing that comes out of her mouth is like, I don't know what to say, but I just wanted to come and say hello. That's funny. We can laugh. Once we start laughing, the ice is broken, right? So, yeah, I... Dennis. I'm happy for people to come say hello to me. You're normally no, no, I find by, the bar, by the way. I'm never one dancing. I find it flattering, but um, um, but uh, it is a conversation I've had with many women, and most women I know are against the idea. Most women. That yeah, that, that's know. certainly really? reflected in. That's certainly <laughs> reflected in the in the chat. And um, and, um, and, and now we hear it like they prefer the man. All I say is, ladies, your your aversion to approaching a man. Magnify that tenfold. That's what's going through a man's head when we're thinking about approaching you, okay? <laughs> right? Because, as I said, um, um, like I said many times before, from a man's perspective, it's a risk, yeah? And, um, and, I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's simply because we don't know anything about you. We don't know what kind of person you are. And um, you know what? Uh, uh, so, uh, and unfortunately, I, I mean, I've just messaged um, Sister Yvonne about it. Some of us have had some very harsh rejections. <laughs> yeah, not every woman is very respectful <laughs> um, with the way how it comes to rejecting a man, and um, and we know that it's not every woman. Hell, but, um, hallelujah! So we can take that phrase from Tony, right? But all it takes is just one woman, right? And if you're rejecting the, and uh, and uh, if you're rejecting a guy, she it might have been the wrong time. She might have just had an argument. She might have not been in the mood. And the guy approaches her and she's like, get away from me, <laughs> move me or what have you. She's very abrupt. A man doesn't know that. So he's all, so when he's hearing no, he's hearing no, 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 no. <laughs> Echo. <laughs> Echo for years. Look, guys. Like, and you might, have... not her, you might not approach a woman for another, I don't know, month, a year, <laughs> what have you, based off of that harsh prediction. The poor guy doesn't know is that she was just, it was just the wrong place, wrong time. She was in a bad mood. Something might've happened or what have you. 
we're not we're, we're just look, judging that whole situation based on what's happened in that moment you know right but can some i say something rise above it, others don't yeah some men some men it's uh, some men could just brush it off and say all right next other men it takes them x amount of time to dare i say recover before they feel about approaching someone else so again it depends on the man how resilient he is um what his mindset is like and again going back to how well he's confident within himself. Not all men are, are, are that are strong like that. Some men take harsh rejections very personally and it could take them a long time to recover. Paul, can I speak into that just very quickly? Dennis, I hear you, but mm. I think that what you've just said is nothing to do with relationships. I think that's everything to do with people, mm. right? So as a person, right, if you, if you don't take rejection very well, whether that's rejection, right, from a woman towards you, whether that's rejection in your workplace, whether that's rejection, like, anywhere. You just don't do rejection well. And I... I leave. It's, just, it's just dangerous, I think. Mm. It's dangerous, and, and it's been going on for centuries. It will continue. That people want to enter into relationships before they have a healthy relationship with themselves. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that everybody... Right, it's going to be like super confident. It's going to be super mm. capable. I'm not saying that because I'm saying we're all different and we're all made in whatever way our experiences has taken us to. Mm. But I think there is a need that we are prepared to accept that we live in an imperfect world, and in that imperfect world, things are not going to go right sometimes. If something goes wrong, right, accept that it's something that went wrong, right. There's a, there's a 50 50 chance every single time that something will go right or it will go wrong a lot of that is often determined right by by the um by the way in which you make your approach i'll share a real life example i remember one one time i was out paul you was actually at the same place many many uh, many no, years no 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 oh, you bring, you don't bring me into oh, this you'll be standing there leave, leave me yeah. out to this yeah. you are absolutely I, I wasn't there do there. not bring okay. me into this you're on your own <laughs> just take your blows as you go go on anyhow this is how the story goes we were out in a place standing up um behind some females which we knew, we all knew they were collectively there, but they had some friends with them that we didn't know. And so there we are, I'm talking, I'm I just like being my typical self. I started talking to a woman I didn't know, right? Now, first things first, I was not coming on to her. I was just talking to her, right? Mm. Now, it was quite clear after a certain while that she wasn't really kind of like fueling the conversation. Mm. And it became then quite clear that that didn't matter to me. I still wanted to talk to you, right? So the conversation continued. She then turned around, and I lie not to you, I say it in a public forum, because I'm not ashamed of it, it's the truth, right? She turned around and she kissed me on my white shirt, right on my chest, right? And left one big lipstick mark, right, on my shirt. And she looked me in my face and said, well, I hope your partner doesn't mind that when you get home tonight, all right? I, I, was, turned to I, I, was, I was there. <laughs> I turned to her and I said, quite honestly, I said, my dear, if my relationship was so weak, right, with a woman, I shouldn't even be in that relationship with her. She laughed, she smiled, and you know, for the rest of the night, right, we had such a great time just talking and vibing with each other. We got on really, really, really well, right? Now, I'm not suggesting that's for the faint hearted because it's really not a great plan, right? But my point is, that like the way you approach situations or the way that you deal with difficult situations can sometimes determine the outcome of a situation, right? And you need to know yourself and what you're capable of because don't swim in water that you can't deal with just because you see somebody else doing it. You will hurt yourself, right? You will absolutely hurt yourself. I just think that like people need to be real, understand their, um, their ability, know what they are capable of. And if, you, if you're hurt, if you're still healing, right, then don't put yourself in a position where you can be hurt again. But don't blame it on somebody else. There's a question. There's a question. There's a thing, sorry, guys. There's a question that's been in the chat. Um, well, on on Facebook, someone's asked twice, and I think it's it's a reasonable thing for us to air. And and the question is this. And Fitzroy and Dennis, I want to I want to go to you guys on this. What impact, if any, do you think feminist politics has had with how 
black women interact with black men. Ooh. Ouch. Sorry, sorry to take us. No, take that's us fine. There. That depends on how you understand feminist politics. Yeah. Because there's more than one kind of feminism. Take it from your, your understanding. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I come at this a couple of ways. And it goes back to something I said right in the beginning. Um, I'm a father of three daughters. That means I have to take feminism seriously. Uh, feminism in the sense of thinking about how I as a man, through my relationship with my daughters and through their relationship with me, how I then relate to the world of women at large. So if you're thinking about feminism as how do we create a more equal world for men and women, I have no difficulty with that. Mm. And actually, to me, it's common sense. So why wouldn't we be thinking about that? And I come at that from a very personal standpoint. There are ways of looking at feminism which turn it into a philosophy which is about women being on top. Mm. And I kind of get that. I think that's a much more limiting form of feminism. But I think that if you believe that that's the only version of feminism that exists, then you are misleading yourself. So I think there is, I have no difficulty with feminism as a way of looking at power relationships and relationships in general between men and women. But not everybody looks at it that way. Uh, yeah, I, so, I, think, I think the person who was asking the question was, was edging towards the second, the second way you, you, that, that you looked at it. Um, I, I can't speak on her behalf. Yeah, but I think, yeah. I think that's, that's where they were edging yeah. because I don't think anybody would, would, would well, I, I would hope, that no one would argue that there isn't an absolute need for us to address the, the, the power imbalance between men and women societally. But I think but some people don't call that feminism. That's, that's the point that I would make. Yeah. Some people, and, and, and I think you, that's you and I might think that's self evident. And for me, that's feminism. But some people don't call that feminism. For some people, feminism is that, yeah, women are going to be on top. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Dennis? No, I, I echo what um, Fritz was saying. It's it's it, um, it, it definitely becomes an issue, and don't get me wrong, I'm all for um, women empowerment uh, because I, I'm I'm of the personal opinion that the black woman is the um, is the most downtrodden and disrespected um, female on the planet. That's just my personal opinion. So I'm all about um, empowering um, women, um, but I do hear what Fritz is saying that it becomes a danger when it gets to the point where we go to the other extreme, where the pendulum swings the other way, where it's down with men and women, women, women at the expense. It, everything is about what I call mat, balancement. You need the male and the female. You need the feminine and the masculine energy. And one shouldn't be more dominant than the other. I do agree that in society, there is a bit of an imbalance. They, they, and it's very apparent, apparent in society, you know, with women getting paid less uh, for doing the same jobs and things like that, for example. So I do think that the, there's a balance that does needs to be addressed, but it shouldn't be addressed to the point where we're now getting to the point where it's just about women, women, women only at the expense of men. And that's when you hear about, you know, um, women saying things like, oh, I don't need a man. And, and things, I think there's a danger in, in that sense. So for a man to think that way, also, there's a danger. It needs to be balanced properly because both, both parties, I mean, unless you were cloned or something, both, um, <laughs> both energies, mother and father, brought you into existence. So, you know, both energies are needed. So, guys, it's, um, it's, been, it's been a great conversation. And I, I made a decision that I would not um, stop at our normal three o'clock today um, because. Last week, I had many, many complaints that I stopped the conversation too soon. Um, and, and as always seemed to happen, we then went on to have another one hour conversation um, once we cut the, the, the Facebook feed. Look, guys, thank you so much for coming mm. to share um, because there was a point in the last few weeks when I didn't think this was going to happen. Um, I didn't think the brothers would step up, but you have. And more importantly than just stepping up, I feel that's lots of the words that have been said um, are the sort of words that give us hope in terms of the, the, the generation and the breed of men that are still out there, that's still still available and still, you know, you know not even talking about available, but simply that the men exist. And, and I feel that based on some of the conversations I've had, there's been this belief that 
men don't exist or they're all married. You know, that's that's another thing I hear that oh. all the men who would would reason and think that way were all married or they're all taken. And I think it's it's important to know that the day before they were taken, they were single. Oh. <laughs> yep. And I, and I think it's very, very important. And tomorrow there are single men out there who are going to be in relationships. So it's really about, you know, the people developing themselves, making themselves open to that initial conversation. I know Andrew and Tony talked about being open to those initial conversations and then seeing where, where it goes. If we, if we try to enter into, into too much bits and pieces, then we're in trouble. Look, uh, I've never done this before. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna let everybody know that I'm gonna cut the, the Facebook feed shortly after all of my guests have done their roundup talk but I'm not going to disconnect Zoom itself. So at that point, after the conversation, anybody who wants to stay on and have a chat afterwards, I always like doing that. So, so I, keep, I keep doing that. So what I'm going to do now, while we're still on the Facebook Live, I'm going to invite Andrew for his closing statements on anything he wants to talk about, even uh, life as a tax inspector. <laughs> yeah, you keep bringing it back to that. That's certainly going to harm my... <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy, the HMRC. Yeah, go with. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, though, um, I mean, I, I have two children. I've got a daughter and a son. And I'm aware that her first impression of a man is going to be not by just what I say, but what I do. And I realise me growing up, but also seeing my children grow up, you think your children are not watching and they're actually watching. And they can recount things to you that you think, wow, you, you notice that. So in terms of being a man, I want to be the sort of man that gives my daughter. So if my daughter's hearing, oh, black man, no, no, no. She can think, well, my dad's okay. And he's a black man. So <laughs> all men can't be, can't, be, uh, can't be that bad. But also as well, the fact that I'm not with her mother but the fact is we can still have a relationship because we have to have a relationship we're a parent from the same children so it should be a case where you know something happens and then that's it and you're demonstrating all that is wrong with the dynamics between men and women so hopefully this chat that we've had has given women out there a little bit more um of a, a different perspective on in there thank you andrew um tony First, I'll say thank you for inviting me on, Paul. It's, um, it's been an enjoyable conversation. I've enjoyed sharing the platform with like these very intelligent men and these very well-turned-out females, which I'm looking at at the moment. <laughs> he went there. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is the truth. Why should I lie? Right? Um... I have enjoyed the conversation. I think it's been, some of these conversations can get kind of like really like twee and just talk for talk's sake. But I think we've actually covered interesting and useful ground today. So I'm just glad to have been part of that process. Thank you. Dennis? Paul, um, just want to say thank you very much for inviting me on the show. Also want to say it's perhaps a special shout out to Sister Janet Wolf, who put me in touch with you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's my first time on your show. Um, uh, I think the conversation, I think more conversations like this need to happen. Um, it's definitely needed um, to help. I, I think it's um, relevant for both genders, really, um, if we're to help change um, the narrative. So I think uh, I would encourage you to definitely keep doing what you're doing uh, with this podcast. because It's definitely helping to educate the masses and... Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, and it was a, a pleasure to be here. I look forward to many more. It's all right. Um, I want to say two things. Um, the first is that I grew up as part of a generation of black boys who became men, most of whom were phenomenally talented. And a lot of us have had things happen to us over the years which has led us to question that talent. What I'm hoping is that we're beginning to see a re-emergence of that. And it's never too late for that to happen. 
So that's important for people to believe. It's important for men to believe, and it's important for women to believe as well. Because I think that, you know, there's been a whole conversation about whatless men. No, there's not whatless men. There are men who are carrying things that need dealing with, and that comes back to the conversation we were having earlier on. The second thing I want to say is that the next time anybody encounters a black man, um, listen to them. And when I say listen, listening is more than the absence of speaking. Listening is really trying to tune in to what is being said to you and maybe putting some of your preconceptions about what's being said aside. So listening is not as easy as sometimes that we think it is. It takes work. Uh, and then see where it goes from there. Because sometimes that listening is all it takes for us both to be able to then proceed on our way, um, you know, in a better frame of mind. So that thing about listening, I think, is really important as well. Cool. Can I just quickly add on to something what, um, off the yeah. back of what Fritzoy was saying? Um, men, um, if a woman has to listen to you, make sure you've got something worthwhile to say. Mm -hmm. Worthwhile and intelligent. Don't come to her with rubbish. Yeah, make sure you're talking sense and something intelligent if she's going to listen to you. So I just wanted to add that in. Ladies and gentlemen, look, we've come to the end of another show. It's always a pleasure, but I think um, for me, this week was an was a, was a additional pleasure. Um, you know, we, we don't gather as men and have a lot of these conversations. We don't ha have these conversations you know, even my very, very best friends, we don't talk to each other on this sort of level. And I think that must change. I think it's, it's, it's immensely important that we as men start to express ourselves in a way which helps us to connect with that part of us that is really the best part of us. Yeah, because for too long we've been suppressing it and, and sending our representatives out instead of sending our true selves. And I think it's very important that we start to do that. I think for the sisters, we hear you, we hear you. We hear that what you're trying to get is a better version and that's not a wrong thing to want. It is important that you want that higher version because what it tells me is that if you accept me, that must have mean that you found a better version in me and that means we're, we're, we're going somewhere. And gents, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm gonna shut down the Facebook feed now. Like I said, everybody's welcome to stay whether you, you just joined it 10 seconds ago or you've, you've joined us at the top of the hour. I put the Zoom details into the Facebook chat. The reason why I don't do it when we're doing it on the live is because I know there are people who hack these things and, and, and misbehave themselves. I think this experiment this week has certainly worked and I think I'll carry it forward for the future shows. Um, please, please, please. I'm gonna be posting the video later of this chat and it will also be to my YouTube channel more importantly, I did post yesterday at midday a conversation I had with Wendy Williams, who's the author of the Wind Rush Lessons Learned. And listen, guys, I cannot stress to you how important it is that you watch that video. There are stuff that I learned about what really took place in the Wind Rush scandal. Some of my facts were confirmed, other things I simply did not know. And, and you know, it's important that we understand the genesis and the fuel that kept the Windrush scandal going. But for this week, this is the end. Thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you in a week.